Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO of the Milken Institute, Michael Clowden. Well, thank you all for joining us. It has been a wonderful two days. I hope uh, all of you will agree with that. Uh, we've been excited by it. I think the uh, panels have been wonderful, uh, but the, uh, the attendees have been great, and we think it's just uh, fabulous to see the discussions that have been going on and uh, uh, people exchanging ideas and uh, uh, going in and out of the different sessions. It's exactly what we hope happens at an event like this, and so uh, I hope that you, uh, you agree that it was worthwhile and that you'll join me uh, in thanking the people who made it possible. So I'd like to thank uh, first our partners who worked with us so, uh, so diligently in putting this together, IntroSight Advisors, as well as uh, Spark Thinking that uh, helped to take care of all the production details. Um, and a special thank you, I also want to thank the great hotel staff uh, here that's done such a wonderful job but a very special and very important thankful uh, thanks to the incredibly hardworking staff of the Milken Institute. Uh, my colleagues have really worked hard in putting this together. Uh, I think uh, you have seen the professionalism that went into it and uh, hopefully all the difficult things took place behind the scenes and you didn't see them and noticed just instead a great experience. So please join me in thanking the, everyone at the Milken Institute and our partners in getting this together. I, well, and also, uh, before we get going with our last session, let me just say I hope that uh, uh, you will join us uh, in uh, next February when we will do our third annual MENA Summit. Uh, and for those of you who are able to do so and can, you'll join us at our global conference uh, in Los Angeles, April 27th to May 1st. But now join us in what is going to be a great concluding panel. Uh, as we talk about global capital markets, and let me, let's welcome our panel on stage, along with the moderator, Rachel Pether, who's a senior advisor of the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute. Panelists, Rachel, it's all yours. So welcome everyone. We are down to the closing session of Milken. Uh, global capital markets, by definition, is obviously very broad. Uh, global, unconstrained by geography, capital markets, unconstrained by asset class. So we will be touching on some of the topics that have already been discussed thus far, but we also appreciate it's 5.30 on day two, so we don't want too much repetition. So we will really be looking at the private markets, which includes private equity, private credit, real, uh, real estate and infrastructure, uh, also emerging markets, and all in the context of what are some of the risks that we're seeing in the market at the moment. And you know, we all know what these risks are. Uh, as some of you may know, or may be able to tell by my accent, I'm from New Zealand. And just to give you an idea of the, the depth of the people on the stage, between their companies, they manage more money than almost the entire GDP of New Zealand times two. So we've got a, a huge wealth of experience up here on stage, so I'm really excited and honored to be sharing the stage with them in this closing panel. So uh, down the left, we have Joe Nagger, who's a partner and head of structured products at Golden Tree Asset Management, as well as a portfolio manager at Golden Tree Loan Management. Uh, then we have Tom Fink, who's the chairman and chief executive officer of Bearings, a global investment management firm. Uh, then we have Jeremy Collar, who's the founder and CIO of Collar Capital, a global private equity firm. And down the end, we have Hazem Ben Ghazem, who's InvestCorp's co-chief executive officer, and he's also the managing partner of the InvestCorp Technology Partners Group of Funds. So gentlemen, to kick things off before we go into some of the specific asset classes like private equity and private debt, let's start with some context setting. 
Uh, there's obviously a few key risks on the horizon at the moment. We have China-US trade war, <coughs> we have Brexit, we have rising rates. And we've also got a good dispersion of, of panellists. We've got two from the US, two from the UK. So we're going to get a very balanced view, we hope, on some of these risks. So let's start off by the US-China trade war. Where are we sort of, where are we <coughs> up to with that? And where are we seeing the sort of short-term and long-term effects of that? Me. Uh, trade war, US-China. So. China will sign any agreement that uh, the U.S. puts in front of them in March. They've got growth. They're saying it's 6 percent, but actually they've got growth of probably around 1.5 percent at the moment. Um, when they was 15 percent, they were saying 10 percent. Now that it's 1.5 percent, they're saying 6, not to destabilize the markets too much. You know, government officials are finding it very hard to, do, to with, even within China, government officials are finding it very hard to do business <coughs> with private because of all the anti-corruption that's, uh, that's being uh, going on. And um, yeah, all the, all, a, lot of, a lot of businesses moving away from China to other Asian countries, but um, China will sign any agreement. The execution of that agreement may be something else, but they'll sign any agreement <coughs> in, in March. And so on that data point that you mentioned, how can you, if you can't trust the, the data that's coming out of a country, how does that sort of impact you as an investor? As an, invest as an investor, you have to know that, um, that you're investing on a micro level, but most importantly, <coughs> you've got to know that you're definitely in the middle of autumn. You know, we had an amazing uh, spring after, after the winter of 2008. We've had a long summer. We're in the middle of winter. Um, you know, if you've really got growth at 1.5%, I made up that number, but, um, but if you've really got growth at 1.5%, that is really bad news for China and the, and the rest of the world. And so just looking then, um, moving sort of cross Cross Atlantic, so we've got the, the US China trade war on one hand and then Brexit playing out in the markets on the other. How do you think uh, Brexit will play out and how is that affecting the UK and your investments in Europe? Well, you know, the thing about Brexit is it's a man made issue at the end of the day, right? And much like the trade war. And so you have these issues that no one can sit here and say it's a hard Brexit, they'll get a deal. No one knows, you know, and, and anymore, you know, I do agree trade wars do end eventually, and will it end in, you know, 30 days or 60, 90? You know, we'll find out soon enough, same with Brexit. The reality is you step back, and since the referendum, what has been the effect on businesses and decisions and investments you made? And it's certainly, you have to, it's, it's, cause some drag on the economy, you know, in, in the UK and Europe. As an investor, we have to take that in consideration. So our real estate investments, you know, in the UK, you're, you know, taking that in consideration when you think about valuations and, and things like that. That said, we just, you know, you don't know what it means until the event occurs. And then you react again.
So just picking up on that, on that valuations point, as a credit manager, where are you cu currently seeing valuations? So where are we in that cycle? So you know, maybe it helps me with the, on slide two, um, if you want to put that up uh, on, on this chart. Uh, well, valuations have been, been interesting because um, they've, they've fluctuated a lot. And some of this, I think, is a little different story than we've seen in maybe 2017, where you know there was much more uh, agreement about um, direction of growth, direction of rates, direction of uh, maybe politics. Um, and you know by the middle of 2018, we saw you know, broadly across kind of risk markets, uh, you know, kind of rates uh, spreads, um, equity markets expressing. Uh, you know, levels of valuations that were quite high. Um, so in the top 80 percentile for a long period of time, so kind of from a macro perspective, uh, not super attractive valuations. Um, what that meant for all the golden tree and many of our funds uh, was, was, was much higher buying power. Um, we were much more defensive. The, um, you know, what you saw sort of coming into October as, as, can you be clear what happens to your markets when interest rates go up? Yes, yeah, so it is interesting. Uh, usually, when interest rates are rising in credit markets, which is where we spend most of our time with golden tree, usually spreads contract. It's usually a good thing. Uh, so you tend to see a positive event, except sometimes when rates are going up, they go up too fast, then the spreads can widen. That's actually sort of a really bad event. So that's really on the, on the valuation side that we're seeing in the, the public markets. I do want to just move across 
um, to what we're seeing in the private markets at the moment. So recently with private equity, we've been seeing a lot of money piling in and it's been on this you know, upward trend in terms of valuation. But you could argue, um, back to Joe's point, that it's really just been following the market up in terms of valuation. So it's really just a beta play. You're not really generating much alpha there. How are you seeing the private equity market? So I would say, Rachel, that um, first of all, the private equity asset class, it's a relatively young asset class. It's 40 years. And it has gone through a fair bit of iterations. The first generation of private equity, or the first phase in the 80s and the 90s, was very much a leverage play. Okay, I, the very first private equity deal we did, Tiffany's, I think we put 5% equity and 95% debt. Okay, and it worked out well, but you know what? You can exactly see why it worked out well. Uh, today, private equity investors across the board do not make money because of multiple yes. arbitrage because I was able to buy cheap and sell high. It is such a liquid and sophisticated market. You should assume if you are buying, you are buying because you're the highest bidder. That's why you're successful in buying that business. So your value creation will come from what else you do during that time frame. And that is, I think, what is differentiating many different players in the private equity world, those who are able to uh, articulate a clear value added in their model. I want to come back to the point of Brexit and, uh, and the China-US trade. Just two questions to the audience. First of all, if I am to suspect every single person in this room has either been to the UK, have had dealings with the UK. It is not because the UK is part of the EU, because there's something special about that country. A part of it is the Anglo-Saxon mindset, the approach to business, and the difference in how people think compared to the rest of the Europe. That is not going to change. Okay. Brexit or no Brexit. Okay, the UK will continue to have its attractions because of uh, the personalities, the characters, and effectively how English deal with themselves. And you know what? That is very attractive. From Chinese to Japanese to Middle Eastern to American, you can very easily find yourself and feel at home dealing in the UK. You can't say that about the rest of, the world, the rest of Europe. So that's why I'm actually more on the positive side. Whatever happens in Brexit, it's going to be a short-term blip. Long-term, I'm definitely kind of uh, putting money there. On China, um, we struggle with this a lot internally. But here's a question to all of you. If you are a betting person, either as an investor, businessman, or operator, take a 20-year outlook. If you are to bet on the US or China, where will you put your money? I don't know. Not formally known as Great Britain. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I decided to ask between the, U the US and, and uh, the US and China. Yeah. Yeah. Just, um, I actually have a question for you. On the valuation point, I think it's really interesting what you brought up about like private equity now, it's really being about, about, about able to add value. I remember there was a very famous port deal a few years ago, not, not DP World, but it was a, the Port of Melbourne and it went to a consortium of sovereign wealth funds that overbid by 66%. So it was a huge you know, overbid. And I actually met with one of the lead bidders uh, in that project last week and I said to him, how did you like, how do you justify that? That's a huge, you know, overpaying the original asking price. And he said, oh, well, we may have overpaid by 66%, but the next bidder was 100 million, so we actually only overpaid by 100 million. And it was, I don't know, is that how, when you look at a deal, I guess, your, your key value it is just that you can add more value than the next bidder versus on an absolute level. You know, what's the value of an art piece? The price is dictated by the highest bidder who believe he or she right. can do so much with that piece of art and effectively sell it at a higher price. So really, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And uh, uh, as for once, I don't yep. think, yeah, sorry, just to finish, I don't think um, we will judge individuals or groups by what they paid for the business. I like for us to judge them, but what have they done during their ownership? Absolutely. And did they leave a better business on the way out? Absolutely, but you've got to, you've got to, temper that with, um, you know, today, you've got to ask yourself the question, not 
does everything have to go right to make this investment work? But because we're, we're just about, we are approaching, we're in autumn and approaching winter, as it were, um, at some point, you've got to ask, in that environment, I want to invest where everything has to go wrong for me to lose money, as opposed to, you know, everything has to go right. That's right. No, you, 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 had, you had construction companies in Saudi uh, uh, seven years ago at 24 times saying it's, diff it's a new paradigm, it's different. You know, and, and they've come you know, with a new regime change, just a regime change, um, they've come crashing down. Everything had to go right to justify to justify the, the port authority and that and in this environment I you know that is that is of huge risk so so in a way navigating what types of businesses you're buying um, you know what what interest rates will go up there's no question about that if they don't go up it's because there are bad things happening in the economy you know, so either way, it's not good. For, um, and, uh, you know, as we know, interest rates going up is going to bring down multiples. We've got to be investing with that in mind. We're responsible for pensioners' money. Um, you know, what I, used to, I used to be a pension manager. The one thing I hated is when a manager came in and said, if only the markets hadn't changed. <laughs> and, and one of the things I, 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 you know, I've admired about Investcorp, which we, we're, we're working closely at the moment, is, is their ability to both add value and pick the industries that they've been investing in. Mm. I, I think another point that's changing, and I think some of this is more apparent for a lot of investors post-crisis, uh, and you made the point about how the private equity market has changed over 40 years and it's gone somewhat from a multiple game. But a lot of private equity is being invested in growth and, and it's also about who's investing. Am I investing purely for an equity return or am I investing for a level of income and maybe a little less equity return because I want to own those operating cash flows for a long period of time, which is in some ways a hedge against... But then you're getting multiple... You're trading oh, right. multiple for But you might overpay in the short term on a multiple basis if you have confidence in the long-term sustainability so, of the yeah. cash flows and or um, the ability to, to grow that enterprise yep. over a long period of time. So it's, it's less about you know, that three to five year, can I make my multiple in three to five years? And we're seeing investors, we, we just traded a portfolio company where you know, one of the investors wants to own it for much longer than others yeah. and paid to own the asset for the long-term cash flows. Yeah. But if, you, if you're investing, if you're choosing private equity groups, for instance, you know, it, there are a lot of sheep out there. Yes. You know, for, for trying to catch the beta. Well, I hope we'll find the dollies in those sheep which multiply and multiply over and over again. I think that's a UK joke for... <laughs> that's a Brexit joke. Um, one, one thing that we're seeing uh, sort of on this, um, this evolving PE market has been um, secondaries have been one of the, one of the biggest themes. Yeah. But you could argue that these have just been mushrooming, again, kind of in line with the right. market. Yeah. What would be your view on that? I, I would totally agree. That, um, you know, there was 72 billion of trades in uh, secondaries, but you know, but, but if you put it in context, um, so in, in, if you look at Abu Dhabi at the moment for, in real estate, and you talked about real estate, it, you'd be talking about development really. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk about Seoul today in South Korea. You know, you would be, when you talk about real estate, you'd be talking about secondaries. If you want to buy Google, you'd be talking about a secondary today. So, you know, when I started, there was, I think there was five millions of secondaries. You know, it started, became an asset class 40, 30 years ago. Um, it, it was, I think the market was like five million in 1990. In 2005, it was eight and a half billion. 
2010, 20 billion. Last year, 70 billion. My prediction would be it, in 10 years' time, it'll be at least 300 billion. What, what other markets, financial markets, are growing five times? I'll, it, it, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, please. I was going to say, I'll give you the private equity perspective. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, secondaries was a bad word. Yeah. Why is that? It's associated with failed funds. Fund has failed, LPs have Absolutely. given up, happy to sell at any price. And that's where the likes of this, the rise of the secondary markets came on the back of that. However, today, we really look at the private equity asset class. Well, that, sorry, that was never true, actually, because investors sell for their own reasons. You know, there are sellers that are looking to sell bad funds, but if people investors are selling a portfolio, a pension plan or, or, or um, a bank. You know, the banks were selling because of uh, uh, Basel oh, and exposure, three, uh, exposure yeah. cost of capital, etc. It was net, I, but that 100% agree yeah. um, that, I mean, luckily for me, because no one else came in for a long time, yeah. so I could learn the craft. But sorry for interrupting. So th that is kind of, <clears throat> but if we look today, uh, private equity asset class is de facto becoming a quasi liquid instrument. Yeah. With partnership with the likes of Color Capital, where the secondary and the GP investors can then have a partnership where we can offer our investors a liquidity tool. That tends to be the biggest negating issue reaching out to investors. In the private equity asset class, they'll look, I'm locked in for five years, you're going to give me 18%, but maybe I can go on the market, I can be in and out. So I think private equity and secondaries will probably evolve to be together as one. And I won't be surprised if in the medium term, you will have joint firms yeah. that are both secondary and primary, where you as Mr. or Mrs. Investor can deploy your, asset, your equity in whatever asset class, and there are instruments that will secure you some, some form of liquidity throughout your investment cycle. I mean, we've worked together twice with, without even knowing That's the right. first time. So in India, we bought a lot of second, we bought 47% of the LP position in a fund called IDFC. And a few months later, you bought the we GP. We bought the GP. And coming from different angles, we are today partners in India. Yeah. Six Who months knew? ago, didn't even know about it. So. And, uh, and, then, and then in here, you've created, you're, it's become an anachronism, the, the club deal. It's yeah. become much harder. We have, we you have. Started, you actually were the, one of the first in the whole of Europe, buying Gucci and That's right. uh, Tiffany's and all these other businesses. Right. And, then, and then the club deal has, um, you know, the market's matured so much, the club deal's become uh, and become so much more sophisticated, the club deals become uh, much harder. Yeah. And so, and, and so w what we've done together is... Well, we have offered our clients in the Gulf uh, a liquidity tool for their private equity exposure in the tunes of a billion dollars. So yes. we're so proud to have Collar uh, be our single largest institutional investor. Uh, and I hope that partnership will continue. It's a great for the GP. It's a great for... Uh, the Collar Capital team, but also most importantly, it's important for our investors who today, when they invest with us or with anyone else, there is a part of them knows I have a liquidity option if I do need to, for whatever reason that may be. Mm. But and the advantage for Investcor, I think, and for us, and for us to understand their alignment is this is their first European buyout fund as a fund. And, you know, it from our perspective, apart from all the analysis we've done, if we look at the alignment, um, it has to work for you. Yeah. And for you as Mr. And investor us. with us Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. I want to um, pick up on one of the points that you made about bank selling because of uh, cost of capital and then move on to the private debt. But just to clarify our one point on the liquidity in private equity. So one thing that institutional investors were sort of seeking when they went for private equity was to capture that illiquidity premium. So when they go for the private equity with liquidity option, is there still that, that upside or it's more going to that private equity becoming quasi-liquid? So you're more going into it to get a 
a cash flow versus... I think, it's, I think it connects with what Tom was talking about, that the private equity asset class is perhaps evolving to be beyond buy it, own it for four, five years and sell. The way I see it is there are some great businesses which we sold during our times and we wish we owned for another 20 years. And that's where the second generation of owners, the likes of uh, Collar, can come and step into the shoes of the investors who felt their time is up. Our founder uses the example of a uh, train, that we as investors, we are, uh, we are passengers on a train, we jump on the train, it takes the next train station. There comes a point where we get off the train station, and, but that train continues its journey. And I think for us as investors... Because of the structure of private equity, the 10 years, the four year hold correct, period, etc. Correct, correct. So, so just tying this back together to the bank selling because of cost of capital and this, I guess this, this intersection between the private debt and the, the bank debt market. Joe, I know you work in structured credit. Can you talk more about what you're seeing uh, in that market at the moment? Uh, through, you know, uh, this 
cycles. And uh, maybe one to come, maybe to come um, a little bit more uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, optimistic uh, going forward. You know, maybe to build on what Joe said, and he's making very good points, and maybe and tie it back to even the discussion you had on the secondaries. Go all the way back to the 1980s. You know, it's been a 40-year industry, as you were saying, uh, with private equity, but that also was the birth of the leverage loan, bank loan, senior secured markets. What you're seeing over 40 years in the U.S. and probably more dramatically over the last uh, 20 years, less, or more, uh, more recently in the last 20 years in Europe, is the fact that the markets are evolving, there are more players, there's more, there's secondary liquidity. So, you know, in the mid 90s, um, you, when I was a lone trader, you know, we were trading with a much smaller set of institutions. By the late 90s, the CLO market was starting to grow and there were more managers, more liquidity behind the loan markets. It evolved in Europe thereafter too. So when you think about, uh, for instance, the valuations and the structures, some of that reflects if there's more liquidity in the underlying instrument, then you get away maybe with uh, looser structures, covenant light, a little more leverage in there, because the buyers may view that as I can sell at least. And in, in the, you know, the, the big difference you have, sometimes you see between, let's call a, uh, a more liquid public syndicated market or a smaller private market is you should have a tighter structure, less leverage, um, more covenants in that private smaller deal because there's just fewer people who are going to be able to buy it. And, Joe. and the other thing is, you're right, it's volatility. The bigger the market, the more players, the more likely volatility hits for other reasons. Joe, just for curiosity, what exactly is a CLO? Ah, so, it's a good question. Uh, it stands for finalized loan obligation. And really all it is is a pool of bank loans and funded essentially by the issuance of tranched up liabilities and equity. The senior most tranche is reached the way to AAA by the way to And then mezzanine tranches are sort of rated AA So one thing that sort of struck me from that graph is that you saw it ramping up to 2008, obviously in the financial crisis, CLOs came under a lot of fire because no one really knew what the underlying was. And if you looked at the graph again, it's been ramping up again to now, so. Sorry, they, they did know what CLOs were. That was the beauty of CLOs because yeah. they were in a lot of private equity buyouts yes. where you could actually analyze the equity. And this, yeah, so that was the, the we were buying CLOs with 30% yields in 2009 because we were analyzing the equity. It's very different to the CDO market. Mm. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and you, the CLO, the term structured CLO market, put market value aside at the end of the day, when you look at that market and some of the earlier CLOs were done in the 90s, you know, we did our first uh, new issue one in, in 98. You knew the underlying collateral because it was managed and you could make your credit decisions when you're going in during the reinvestment period and when you're managing through when defaults spike. You had that ability to do it. Uh, and your, your financing was locked in. So sometimes when you, when you think about what creates volatilities, if, if you own those loans in a mutual fund and it's open-ended and people are skittish, risk off, like you saw in fourth quarter, you have to sell. But the CLO managers actually could hold those loans, work through the credit cycle, and that's why, uh, you know, in the entire market, the essentially the senior notes of CLOs, the default rate over 20 years has been essentially nil. Yeah. And I think it's one it's misunderstood because what a lot of, uh, and we're seeing this in some politicians, in particular in the U.S. today, they want to call CLOs the next CDOs or the next non-agency mortgage backs, and they were, they're fundamentally different structures. 
and actively managed. And it makes a big difference at the end of the day. And so how are these impacted in the current interest rate environment? Well, it, so what you have to ask yourself is, what are you buying? So as Joe said, it's a tranche structure. And are you buying, a, a, a lot of times those structures are floating rate. If you're buying the liabilities, they can be structured as floating rate. Some fixed rate borrowers want fixed rate, but they're typically floating rate because the underlying assets are floating rate. So they're matched off. So it's, it's not just, they're really not going to trade so much purely on rates as much as other technicals and credit fundamentals. And also on the, um, so another sort of asset class that's impacted by the rate environment, I'd like to touch on real estate a bit. I know we had a, a previous panel on it. Uh, how are you seeing real estate within your portfolios at the moment? And perhaps we could look at the developed market side and also the emerging market side, because I know you're, you're entering in India on the real estate market. I, I can start. So we, we have been investing in real estate in um, the U.S. since 1984. And today we have, I think, in excess of 470 or so properties. Um, first market in Europe we decided to go into 18 months ago was the U.K., right after the Brexit vote. Why is that? Um, there are certain fundamentals in, in, in real estate which we find them quite resilient. Uh, an example, the UK, it is uh, the fastest growing and the most developed e-commerce market in Europe. Uh, that means that uh, all real estate around logistics warehousing is just operating at 98% capacity. Okay? And that is a sound investment area with or without Brexit. Um, I think as a real estate investor, we'll continue to look at opportunities do, during, in those micro changes. Uh, same thing in China. The log investments in the logistic and warehousing sector in China today is probably one of the more exciting things. I myself going to Hong Kong tomorrow specifically to kind of look into what we can do in that particular area. So I think real estate also, um, it has been resilient if capitalized appropriately. Um, and uh, as an asset class, as we go into potentially turbulent times, we feel, as an asset allocation point of view, it is probably a more opportune time to perhaps increase a bit the exposure to the real estate asset class on a more global basis. One thing I think I should add on the uh, global basis is um, what the 2008 cycle told us, or chance told us, is there is no global recession anymore. I remember in college you read about the global recession, what have you. It doesn't exist. 2008, 9, 10 were some of the best years in the GCC. Okay, same thing in Asia, okay, whilst Europe and North America was struggling in a, in a very active way. So markets operate and behave in different patterns. And I hope as global investors, we can be wise in jumping from one wave to the next uh, and effectively being able to deliver the right returns to our investors in good times, which is easy, but also in bad times, which is challenging. And you seem to have made a, a tilt in your portfolio recently to the emerging markets, so to India, to China. Are you seeing that at start of the cycle? It's cycle? a very exciting times. Uh, we have committed in excess of half a billion to the technology sector in China. Why is that? Driven in large part by the US trade war. It's very clear, and it's a very clearly stated policy that the China will go out of its way to support the emergence of its tech champions, its tech unicorns. Mm. Anything from artificial intelligence to e-commerce and what have you. Contrast that with Europe, where today pretty much this has been overtaken by US tech businesses across all sectors. Okay. So is that positive or negative? You know what? We're not politicians. We are investors. Okay. And we believe that is an attractive uh, segment to go in. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, you are racial from New Zealand. You appreciate this. I think there's more sheep in New Zealand than there's people here in the Middle East. Uh, however, this population have grown by 11 times since 1960, whilst the population in India has grown by three times, China by two times, US by 1.8 times. The potential in this part of the world is enormous. And so j just staying on that potential and the risks, uh, the, you know, India sounds so amazing. Oh, sorry for the, it, it sounds so amazing. Average age, well, last year was 29, probably 30 now. Um, larger population, shortly than China, 
and high GDP growth. The problem is foreigners have not made money there. You know, there's been all these promises. And what we've both done, so in your case with IDFC, you've bought a local general partner. In our case, we've partnered with um, uh, the Commonwealth Development Corporation of the UK, where we've done a structured thing, where we're buying secondaries in Indian private equity funds, but we've got a structured um, portfolio where we've got where we're sharing it with CDC, but we've got a 1.2 times liquidation preference to just protect ourselves to so lower return, but at least a minimum of 1.2. So um, I, th I think you, navigating, um, you know, you had to buy yeah. in a way. It's difficult to ignore India, just speaking briefly about India. Uh, the world's fastest growing economy, the current administration we think is doing terrific things to cut red tape and what have you. Uh, in our professional lifetime, I think all of us, China, India, US will continue to be, in my mind, the three most exciting emerging markets. And I do put the US as one of the exciting emerging markets in that bucket as well. So just a follow-up question to your India story. Why have investors not made money there? Is that a regulatory thing? Is that a structural? Uh, it's, it's from, well, it starts with an ethos. So in, in the Anglo-Saxon world, the ethos is, um, I think it's in, investors take, to, you, you look after the shareholders and, and the shareholders look after the business and the team. Whereas in, the, in, in India and China, family first. You know, so, or we did the first secondary in India about 10 years ago, ICICI. We, ICICI wanted to sell a portfolio to prove to their investors that you could get an 8% return. <coughs> so we bought at an 8% return. Fantastic analysis, two times multiple, one and a half times cash in, in, a, in a year. The problem was all the money got stuck in Mauritius for six years when they were trying to work out whether they t should tax us or not. Mm. And for some reason, there is always a reason why for foreigners it's gone wrong, whether it's, whether it's, um, uh, uh, whether it's, the, whether, whether it's taken from you somehow, one way or another, something goes wrong. And, and that's why you've, you know, navigating that and protecting yourself, um, you know, because it is super, super exciting. And it is the future, yeah. which is not quite here yet yeah. for foreigners. But what Jeremy's saying, which is right, is uh, many investors do say, look, I can't make money in India. No. Even many investors in the Middle East, they say, look, why bother investing in the Middle Absolutely. East? The fortune is so com more compelling in Europe or in the US. But the reality is, those markets need time for those generations to evolve. This whole notion of I'm going to build a business, grow it, IPO it, take my money, start something else. That's a very Anglo-Saxon mindset. It does not yet exist in many parts of the emerging markets. It will take time. It will take a second generation, but that's okay. I hope we are all investors through generations and through cycles and through um, uh, periods. So that's fine. Uh, but it just have to, to give it time and give it time to mature and to temper until we, uh, we start to and see attractive areas. Another risk would be the currency risk for, for, for overseas investors. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to dwell on all our mistakes, but we've bought a portfolio which included um, you know, some fantastic assets in Nigeria. Who the hell knew that the collateral damage of, of an oil price crash was the Naira would f fall by 50%, which obviously hurts US dollar returns. Mm. And, and so, you know, navigating all that, why bother? And yet, you know, Africa is the future. India is the future now in a way. And so finding, finding a method of, of, we're working with the Commonwealth CDC, which is, which is uh, one of the largest investors in India, where they've put a pot together and we're investing in secondaries alongside that pot with a liquidation preference, which keeps, which is 
What's in it for them is strategic in terms of changing the market, providing liquidity, leading a developing country um, liquid, for liquidity, etc. For us, obviously, for our, the millions of pensioners we represent, it's, um, it's, it's making sure that at least minimum re the cash flow is much, much faster if you're getting 100% of the cash flows with 50% of the money up. Mm. and uh, with a guaranteed, it's sort of guaranteed return, but it's navigating that is, is exciting and scary. Mm. I think with emerging markets, you know, you talk about the currency risk. In Nigeria, there was a very big institutional investor from the Middle East that was invested in Nigeria, and it was a dollar-linked investment, but even then there were currency controls on actually getting those dollars out. Yeah. So even if you don't have the currency risk, there's still a risk associated. Yeah. Well, in China, it's fascinating because there is a tsunami of secondaries there. But we've just applied for 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 Remimbi license because you have to, you know, to get re your hands on Remim to buy Remimbi is very yeah. difficult. You've got onshore, offshore. Um, you know, Rich, if I can I just add on the currency uh, point, when we look at the emerging markets, uh, on a risk-adjusted basis, if you compare four regions of the world, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia, I would argue this part of the world is one of the most attractive. Not only that, this is the only <coughs> macro environment where you do have emerging market characteristics, young population, growth, and what have you. However, you're taking U.S. dollar exposure. Eliminating that FX exposure as an investor in your calculation is a significant piece when it comes to emerging market investing. And that's why we, we today announced a significant uh, billion dollar infrastructure vehicle for the GCC, and I hope that is the first of many. Uh, coincidentally, the bulk of the investors in that vehicle are foreigners. They're Western, Asian. First, ex first First exposure, they say, first thing they say, you know what, I was looking for US dollar exposure with an emerging market characteristics to it. And Absolutely. that's what makes this region Absolutely. quite unique. Yeah, the dollar peg certainly helps in that situation. Uh, we have less than five minutes left. Uh, yes, question.
um, you know, it's sort of the height of on and so on uh, disguise. So the, 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 the outcome, right, one of the things we get excited about is, what, what is the outcome? I think, turn the page, you know, do slide nine, is, is distress. Right now, we sit, in, we sit in a market where there's 200 billion, um, you know, there's, there, there's distress in the market that's available today. You know, so that's just a, a market of poultry. We manage, we have six billion in distress that we're sort of invested in and find it's attractive. It's one of our highest allocations for our flagship master fund. Um, and um, that's the today's market, which is you know, not a, a, a very, um, you know, it's still kind of a growth market. But in the next cycle, whenever that is, there will be one someday, which will be the you know, recession and what's more private. Oh, no, it's yeah. a new paradigm. Yeah. That's all. It's not to me yet. And I, I think that the, you know, we, we think we will. Um, and uh, in that cycle, you're likely as a function, because credit has grown a lot, and private equity has tapped a lot, you're likely to have a much bigger distress cycle. And that, to us, is an opportunity. Meanwhile, you still have money to, to, to do. There's you know, plenty of examples of, of interesting um, distress situations. But that's sort of the thing we have on this top. Yeah, you know, I agree with everything you're saying, but, but maybe let it add to it. We're in 10 years of a low return environment. In a, even beyond private equity, you see uh, money flowing into risk assets that weren't flowing there years before. You know, whether it's you know, private credit or, or other types of asset classes, maybe going across the world into new markets. So, you know, some of this is in a low return environment on a relative basis for a long time, people have to find yield. And it's going to force money from public markets where you're only, where you're buying beta into the private markets where there might be some, at least an increased yield for the risk you're taking. And that's just a big overall view. Um, I agree that, you know, the markets have grown. And we were talking earlier, yes, you can get more senior secured leverage on a deal. But underlying this, too, is companies are different. You go back and you look at the nature of the companies we are levering. Uh, you know, there is more technology companies, more service companies, more you know, cash flow driven companies versus hard asset companies you know, in the leverage markets. We've had to adapt because businesses is changing. So some of this, in, in the end, everything we're talking about here, we have to recognize that in the fourth industrial revolution, the nature of economies globally are changing. They're emerging. The U.S. is right. Your U.S. is an emerging market. They're all emerging markets because new businesses are being created every day. The consumer is changing. We move from agrarian to manufacturing to an experience consumer consumption economies increasingly in China it's 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 occurring now for instance and markets have to adjust and so sometimes the old cycles we would see or even some of the stats we would rely on in terms of uh, normal economic and credit cycles um, it you, it's going to be a little different because the world's different at the end of the day Excellent. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. In fact, I think we are probably over time. But I would just like to thank my panelists. It was a huge topic to cover, and you're all bringing different perspectives, and it's been an honor and a pleasure to share the stage with you. So please join me in thanking Hazem, Jeremy, Tom, and Joe for the final pa panel session. <laughs>